Well, good afternoon, everyone. Just got off our call with the White House officials and other governors, and here's what we heard. Dr. Walensky started by talking about the importance of getting kids vaccinated and that last week's approval marked a big step forward. The White House uh, COVID response coordinator, Jeff Zients, highlighted Vermont to all the other governors as having the highest number of five to 11 year olds scheduled for vaccination, leading the nation once again. As a result of strong uptake, we requested another um, additional doses uh, for next week and the White House approved them. So I want to thank them for that. We'll be getting an additional 3,900 doses on top of the 5,100 we were already allotted, making for 9,000. Governors have been working with White House, uh, with the White House on uh, extending FEMA reimbursements for COVID response costs, as well as extending National Guard use under Title 32. Uh, today it was announced uh, by the White House that the President will be extending both of those until April 1. So that's good news for Vermont and for the states. As of this morning, about one third of this entire population, about 14,000 kids, have signed up for their appointment or gotten their first dose. Keep in mind, these numbers only include those who go through the state system. It doesn't include pharmacies or others who partner directly with the federal government. So again, some more good news. And it's so important because as we discussed last week, although kids in this age range usually uh, develop mild, uh, have mild illnesses, uh, cases can be disruptive for families, like not being able to go to school and parents missing work as a result. It's also important to know the five to 11 year olds are contracting COVID at the highest rate right now, which is why parents should sign their kids up as soon as possible. If you have questions, you should reach out to your pediatrician. They have your kids' best interests in mind and will have the answers you need to make an informed decision. The Vermont chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics is also holding forums over the next few weeks and you can find out when and how to join at aapvt.org. Next, as you know, we've seen an increase in COVID cases here in Vermont and across Northern New England. The high number of cases continues to be dominated by those who are unvaccinated. And it's mostly unvaccinated adults who have been eligible for the vaccine for many months. And that's what's been driving our hospitalizations. But it's important to note that Vermont still has one of the lowest hospitalization rates in the country, thanks to vaccines doing their jobs. But this has put more strain on our hospitals, which are already under stress from an increase in patients needing care for health issues that are not related to COVID. The reality is our biggest concern at this point is our ICU capacity. Currently, COVID patients make up about 10 to 15% of those in the ICU, averaging about 14 patients per day over the last month. But because of increases in non-COVID cases, we've had days where there are only 10 open ICU beds in the state. As we've discussed, there are many factors leading to higher ICU usage, like delayed healthcare in the early stages of the pandemic. So if COVID patients rise to, let's say 25%, then the system could be in jeopardy. Think of it this way. If someone has a heart attack or stroke or sustained injuries due to an accident, we want to be sure we have an ICU bed available, which is why, once again, we need you to get vaccinated. And if you're eligible, get your booster and take extra precautions to protect elderly Vermonters. And because cases are high right now, and we're entering the holidays with a Thanksgiving just a couple weeks away, we need to take a few extra precautions. 
like wear your mask indoors in public. Think about the size of gatherings and whether others at these events are vaccinated. Use testing as a tool, like an over-the-counter rapid test or a free PCR test before you get together. And, of course, if you're sick, stay home. If we make smart decisions in the coming weeks and make an extra effort to protect the vulnerable, we can help reduce hospitalizations. But it takes all of us committing to these smart, practical choices, starting with getting vaccinated. None of us wants to step backwards, but we need your help to keep older, more vulnerable Vermonters out of the ICU. So with that, I'll turn it over to Commissioner Pichek for an update on modeling. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Governor, and good afternoon, everybody. We take a look at our presentation this week. We wanted to start with Vermont's case rate. As the Governor said, we did see an increase in our seven-day average this week, uh, increasing 42 percent from where we stood last Tuesday. Uh, generally, our cases had been trending around the 200 cases per day mark over the last six weeks. We saw some increases, some decreases, but generally in that 200 cases per day area, uh, now they stand at about 309 cases per day, so you can get a sense of the size of that increase. Uh, looking at the next slide, you can similarly see the weekly totals up about 700 cases from last week. So significant increase. We just we haven't seen an increase in terms of that raw number of cases during the pandemic. Uh, just over 2,100 cases reported for the week. Uh, looking at the next slide, you can see again that 42 percent increase. It is coupled with about a 9 percent increase in testing over this week. Uh, so testing is up, but of course cases are up more significantly than testing, and it resulted in our positivity rate uh, increasing as well. So again, what that tells us is that the prevalence of the virus, um, it's uh, greater uh, than it was a week or two ago. It's not just a matter of testing or some other uh, data anomaly. And as the governor said, looking at the next slide, you can see this is a trend that uh, is occurring most pronouncedly in northern New England with Maine uh, and New Hampshire. Uh, but it's also uh, generally happening throughout New England as well, even in the southern New England states that have been doing better recently. Overall, cases in New England are up about 12 percent uh, over the last week. So that turns to our forecast slide, which has been really, you know, indeterminate in terms of the direction that we were heading uh, like I said, over the last six weeks or so, when we saw periods of case declines and periods of case uh, growth uh, as well. But at the current moment, the modeling is not anticipating uh, cases to um, decrease over the next four weeks, which is as far out uh, as the model goes. So again, as the governor said, we can certainly change that uh, for the better based on our own um, decisions that we make, uh, protecting the most vulnerable, protecting our families uh, and our friends. Uh, looking a little bit more deeply at the cases, again, as the governor mentioned, you can see that dramatic difference there between the fully vaccinated and the not fully vaccinated rate, that difference of about 3.7 times uh, in terms of the not vaccinated rate being higher. Uh, you can see both of them have increased this week, about 30 uh, percent each, 35 percent for the not fully vaccinated, 31 percent for the fully vaccinated. Uh, but again, that difference is significant uh, in terms of those two uh, case rates and that not fully vaccinated case rate was increasing at a much higher uh, baseline to begin with. Looking at hospital admissions, a pretty similar story to what we saw last week, uh, growing slightly in those that are not fully vaccinated, seeing some improvement in those uh, that are, uh, actually improvement in those that are not fully vaccinated, slight increase in those who are fully vaccinated, a similar trend to what we saw this week, and we'll show that in a minute when we look at our hospitalizations. But looking at the next slide, another um, you know, similarity uh, that we want to look at in our data is the week uh, and weeks following Halloween. Uh, you know, certainly a busy weekend, last weekend and last year as well for Halloween weekend. Colder weather setting in in November, sending more people indoors as well. And you can see that increase that we saw last year in the bottom uh, yellow line and the increase that we've seen this year now. Uh, you know, seven or eight days following Halloween. Of course, the difference here is that following Halloween this year, starting from a higher baseline of cases, um, but still heading into the holiday season, uh, so wanting to, um, you know, get that down as best we can. 
Uh, looking geographically, as we look across Vermont, uh, you'll see that, again, the Northeast Kingdom still at an elevated level of cases. You'll see that 12 of 14 counties saw uh, increases this week. Bennington County is another county now that is worth mentioning in terms of where their case counts stand relative to the rest of Vermont. So elevated cases uh, in Bennington uh, and in the Northeast Kingdom. Uh, on the next slide, you'll see again uh, what the governor said, that age group 5 to 11 clearly has the highest case rate out of all the age groups uh, across the board. Uh, when you look at the 5 to 11 compared to adults, so those over 19 years old, uh, the 5 to 11 rate uh, is double that of the adult rate. And uh, as we said, the Vermont rate had gone up 42 percent this rate ac across the board this week, uh, but that uh, 5 to 11 year old rate is up 59 percent. Uh, so you can see that elevated level of cases and, um, and increasing. So again, all the more important to get uh, that age group vaccinated. Good to hear that we're off to a strong start, uh, but really important to get as many of those uh, vaccinated as we can in that 5 to 11 age group. Turning to college campuses, uh, you can see this week uh, an elevated number of cases across Vermont's uh, college campuses, 103 cases. So that's up from about um, 53 last week. Most of those, most of that increase is attributable to the outbreak that's been publicly reported at St. Michael's. Uh, otherwise, most of the college campuses are pretty uh, calm or at least uh, calm relative to what they've been experiencing for the last few weeks. Looking at long-term care facilities, uh, this week we have seven active outbreaks. That's down from nine last week, so we removed two active outbreaks without adding any. The total number of active cases this week is 103 uh, compared to 166 last week, so seeing some improvement in our long-term care facilities in terms of the number of outbreaks uh, and the number of active cases as well. Talking about hospitalizations, you can see here an elevated number of hospitalizations across the board. 67% uh, over the last seven days uh, have been those that are not fully vaccinated. Down a little bit from what we've been seeing in previous weeks, as we mentioned earlier in the presentation. And looking at the ICU capacity and the ICU numbers, you can see here, again, an elevated number of ICU patients um, across Vermont. About 64% of recent ICU stays have been among the not fully vaccinated. And then in terms of the uh, count, in terms of Vermont deaths, you'll see that uh, we currently for the month of November stand at 13 deaths uh, for this month. Turning now to vaccination, uh, we're still working with the CDC to make sure that our first doses are accurately captured uh, over the last 10 to 14 days since the booster doses have been initiated. Uh, we do believe that the booster doses uh, are accurate um, and much of our other data we don't have any concerns about. Uh, but we are still trying to make sure there is not uh, some overcounting in that initial dose category and some undercounting uh, in the booster dose category. So still working on that. We've gotten some good information from the CDC. Uh, but what we do know from our data, uh, one thing that um, is exciting is that Vermont has administered its one millionth dose of the vaccine. So that includes first doses, second doses, uh, and booster doses as well. So over a million doses administered in Vermont just as of yesterday. Uh, and uh, really thanks to all of those in the medical field that work so hard to get that done. Uh, you can see across the board, the rest of Vermont's data pretty stable in terms of uh, where we rank. And then going to the last sheet, again, another important item, uh, the percentage of Vermonters 65 and older who are fully vaccinated who've received their booster dose. Vermont continuing to lead the country uh, now at about 48% of those 65 and older who are fully vaccinated. So it will be critical to get that number up as high as we can go uh, to make sure those uh, most vulnerable have the greatest degree of protection. Uh, so with that, I'll now turn it over to uh, Secretary Smith. Thank you, Commissioner Pichek. Good afternoon, everyone. As of today, as the governor mentioned, 14,360 children ages 5 to 11 have appointments to get vaccinated or have already begun vaccination. That's just over 30% of Vermont kids in that age range. Specific, and as you saw, we're doing very well in that, in that age range. Specifically for this age range, we have six ongoing EMS clinics, 11 healthcare partner locations available, and between those groups, they're offering about 30 vaccine clinics uh, for children each week. 
We also have vaccine clinics running at 94 schools across the state over the next 45 days. That includes uh, that these are um, two clinics uh, at each school, which means there are approximately 188 school clinics operating. These clinics are in addition to our regular state-run clinics, and many pharmacies are now offering five to 11-year-olds uh, the opportunity to get vaccinated. You can make an appointment for your child by going online, and this is a different um, uh, 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 internet address as we, uh, as we move forward, healthvermont.gov slash kids vaccine. That's healthvermont.gov slash kids vaccine. You can also call 855-722-7878. As I mentioned last week, our goal is to get as many doses as possible into children's arms before the holiday break at the end of December. We continue to urge everyone eligible, not just children, to get vaccinated and get a booster when it's your time. It's especially important for anyone 65 or older to get vaccines and boosters, but anyone at risk of getting COVID should be getting a booster. So far, more than 105,000 people have received boosters in the state, and as Commissioner Pichek had shown, um, we're leading the nation in our, boosted, in our booster administration. And just this week alone, we have more than 100 clinics throughout the state for both vaccines and boosters. The website for making an appointment, if you're not a child, is healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine. You can also call 855-722-7878. Our hospitals are having high patient uh, census. I've mentioned this on several occasions at this podium. This is partly due to COVID, but it's mostly from people who show up sick with a variety of non-COVID related illnesses. We have taken several steps to open or reopen inpatient mental health beds and subacute beds, as well as beds for those struggling with substance abuse. This is to alleviate the strain on our hospitals. Just to give you an example, as of Monday evening, we've opened up 67 of our planned 80 subacute beds. 63 of them are currently filled, and we, we're continuing to work to bring the remainder online and fill them. I think five are due to open up today. However, those steps alone won't solve the issue. We need your help. As Commissioner Pichek pointed out, not fully vaccinated people are more than twice as likely to end up hospitalized than fully vaccinated individuals. And when we look nationally, according to CDC data, the unvaccinated are 12 times more likely to die than those who have been vaccinated. For those who aren't fully vaccinated and are in the hospital with COVID, their average age is just 55 years old. On average, the number of ICU beds available over the past week was just 11, and as the governor mentioned over the month, 14. This is important because we need to ensure that individuals who need hospitalization or an ICU bed can access them. So please get vaccinated and get your booster. Lastly, on this same subject, I wanna mention the use of monoclonal antibodies to help those who contract um, COVID to avoid hospitalization. Although this antibody treatment is not a replacement for vaccines, it is quite effective in treating COVID if you contract the virus. Personally, if I had COVID, my first call would be to my doctor's office to ask them if I can get the antibody treatment and what's the easiest way to do so. So if you contract COVID, please contact your healthcare provider about monoclonal antibody treatment. And lastly, I would like to ask those who can volunteer to sign up to help with vaccines by joining Vermont's Medical Reserve Corps. We are in need of volunteers. Medical Reserve Corps units are community-based groups of volunteers who supplement local emergency and public health resources. You can help even if you're a not trained medical profession, um, professional and 
we do need people in our vaccination sites as we um, as we ramp up our effort. And as you know, our our effort is pretty robust around the state. Please consider volunteering. If you can join MRC, you can join MRC by going online to oncallforvermont.org. That's all one word, oncallforvermont.org. Now I'll turn it over to Dr. Levine for a health update. Thank you, and uh, before I actually get into it, let me reiterate what Secretary Smith just said about the Medical Reserve Corps. First, I want to thank you to all the Vermonters who give so generously of their time and expertise in support of our communities. And I encourage anyone interested to visit oncallforvermont.org and consider volunteering as well. And I want to make a special request of those MRC members who may have thought that their service was no longer needed. We do need you once again as we go down the stretch in our current vaccination campaign and would certainly welcome your assistance at the vaccine clinics. And again, thank you for your service to the state. Now, I'm going to focus on a question I've gotten many, many times, and you likely have as well. And that is, why? Why are we seeing so many cases here in Vermont right now? There is not one simple answer, but there are clearly factors that have come together to create the situation that we're in now. First, the Delta variant. This may sound like old news, but the fact is, this version of the COVID-19 virus is incredibly contagious. An infected person can spread the virus to five people or more, far faster than the original strain. This means it can spread faster than we can trace and alert contacts. And we know that while the vaccines are doing their job of protecting against the most severe effects of COVID, Delta has allowed a certain smaller amount of transmission even among vaccinated people. We are also a victim of our success in at least two ways. Because we kept the virus at such low levels throughout the entire pandemic, most Vermonters did not get COVID, which is great. That meant fewer severe illnesses and importantly, more people alive today. But this also means that not many people got any level of immunity from having had the virus. From seroprevalence studies, meaning looking at antibody levels in people's blood, done with the CDC and the Red Cross, we estimate 3% or less of the population in Vermont had any immunity to COVID before the Delta variant emerged. In addition, we also got so many people vaccinated so efficiently and effectively early on, starting with the oldest Vermonters, that their immunity is likely waning. And as one of the oldest states, the percentage of Vermonters in this situation is higher than in most other parts of the country. Another reason is our behavior has changed. We are more mobile, we're traveling and hosting visitors, doing things in person and gathering more, especially indoors as the weather cools down. And because we could, for a while anyways, when case numbers dropped to single digits, we went back to masking less. So that is leaving people even more vulnerable to the virus right now. Even though we have a relatively small percentage of unvaccinated people, the number is still around 50,000 adults and adolescents. And believe me, this virus is very effective at finding them. Our least vaccinated age group those in their 20s have had their own surge in the past week. And cases in children have also been a significant driver in this recent surge. But fortunately, 44,000 children ages 5 to 11 are now eligible for vaccination. Now, I know for many of us, it can be frustrating to see Vermont looking so different from how we once did during the pandemic. 
But even after all this time, the virus is not something we have absolute control over. There's not one single solution to stop it. We do need to live with it, taking the simple and common sense actions for protecting one another as much as we can. As you've heard, slowing the spread is critical right now while case numbers are high and beginning to strain our hospitals. The more we reduce COVID cases, the more we keep them out of the hospitals and make sure Vermonters can get care for any type of emergency as soon as they need it. Now, for months now, our ICUs have been very busy, but they're mostly caring for patients who are experiencing worsening chronic medical conditions like heart disease and lung disease due to care that was put off or delayed during the early days of the pandemic, as well as they're seeing a lot of life-threatening infections other than COVID. Many have let slip some of their basic health habits, including less nutritious diets, reduced physical activity, irregular sleep patterns, as well as substance misuse some of which are all quite understandable with the stresses of the pandemic. There's even a new term for this now, health debt, the accumulated impact of changes in health behaviors that will have long-term negative impacts on health. The bottom line is that this demand on the healthcare system is going to continue for some time. So if we can minimize the impact COVID has on ICU bed capacity, that is a lot more doable now than reducing the number of people who need urgent medical care. So how do we do this? We need to take all the prevention steps together as a single package. They're not new, but they will make a difference. The most important, as always, is vaccination, and that now includes children. I want to give a huge thanks to the literally thousands and thousands of parents, guardians, caregivers who've already acted on the decision to vaccinate their children. We at the health department were very heartened by the response as soon as registration opened last week. And we look forward to having these kids healthy, well protected, and much more worry free. And as we heard from Dr. Rebecca Bell last week, for those parents who aren't in this early bird group, or if you have any questions about vaccinating your children, please talk to your pediatrician and take the opportunity to participate in a community forum sponsored by the American Academy of Pediatrics Vermont chapter. You can find the schedule of these talks on our website at healthvermont.gov gaf sorry, dot slash kids vaccine. That didn't come out right. Healthvermont.gov slash kids vaccine. Get your booster shot as soon as you can. It's especially important if you're older or have an underlying health condition, as I pointed out in my discussion about why we're seeing more cases. Like other vaccines, your booster takes about two weeks to give you full protection. So now is actually the perfect time to get yours and be ready for the holidays. Remember to get your flu shot as well. Stay home if you're sick. Get tested when needed. This means if you have symptoms, if you have any possible exposure, which could include certain types of gatherings or travel. For vaccinated people, the CDC has just updated its guidance which is to be tested five to seven days after an exposure based on new science. Wear a mask when you're indoors in public spaces or around people who are at higher risk of COVID-19, older adults and those with significant underlying medical conditions. And finally, keep gathering safe. That means small groups outside when possible avoiding crowded spaces, and following the indoor masking guidance. Now, an event can mean a holiday meal, but also a weekend, weekend get-together with a small group of people outside your household. And consider getting tested before and after an event, especially if anyone at higher risk is present. 
At a future press conference, we'll talk about some of the testing you might want to do surrounding holiday gatherings. We are doing really well on vaccination and testing, leading the nation in multiple measures. But remember, I said this is a package for the duration of this year and certainly to prepare ourselves for the holidays, all of the components matter to protect ourselves, our families, and the health of all Vermonters. We have to do it all. Governor. Thank you, Dr. Levine. We'll now open it up to questions. Starting with folks in the room. Governor, last week you said should the infection rate continue, our hospitalization rate could raise as, or go as high as 80. Um, is, is that a criteria? Is that a point where, where you would institute a mask mandate? Um, not necessarily. Uh, and I don't believe we'll get to that point. I think the the point we were trying to make was if we were on the same trajectory, uh, we could hit 80 if we don't, um, if the, the number of those cases needing hospitalizations doesn't uh, decrease. Thankfully, we've seen uh, them drop. Uh, we're back down to where we were before. So um, I don't believe we'll hit that, hit that mark. We want to prevent that from happening before it does. Would be that threshold, especially given ICU capacity, ten it's, beds. Open. It's a number of different uh, uh, points. Um, we, you, you know, from the very beginning, we've said we want to protect our healthcare system. So that's that's our goal. That's our priority. Um, so there are a number of different factors that would uh, impact that decision, and we would do it as a team. So we've discussed uh, this, um, and and again, at this point in time. We don't believe we're at that stage, but we want to be prepared if that does happen, and we are prepared. Governor, um, as you know, you've got a letter today from Vermont Interfaith Action. They are um, most unhappy with your cold weather policy. Um, they call it immoral for you to have the money from the federal government to put people in motels and choose not to spend it and leave people outside. Could you address that directly? Yeah, I, I just don't believe that's the case. Uh, we do have a program. We are um, taking care of those in need. Uh, we'll be announcing other um, uh, parameters of the program um, and receiving some some news from the federal government today and from the White House call will impact that as well. But it's just not the case. We we are protecting those who need our help. When you say that's not the case, there are people I, living outside now and they, they are struggling to get into a motel room. So what's not the case? Well, I'm not sure that that is the case, but okay. Secretary Smith. I mean, Stuart, look, at, I want to back up the train here because it, this, um, we did something that no other state did. We brought people in during, during the first start of the pandemic, before vaccines, before anything else. We took a program that usually runs at the height, about 300 people a, a, a night at the height of it during the winter. And we expanded that program to over 2,500 people. That's, that no other state in the nation did that. There are a few cities that did it, but nobody extended it the way that we have extended it. The cold weather program is the cold weather program. The adverse weather program is the, ad, the adverse weather program we've always had in place for this particular program. We'll be making some announcements here in the next, uh, the governor will be making some announcements in the next couple of days, and uh, it will impact probably the, uh, the adverse weather uh, policy as we move forward. Um, the other thing is we're using FEMA money right now to extend this program to the end of the year. We didn't know about the extension until just a moment ago in terms of what's going on. So we're trying to calculate some other issues as we, I mean some other uh, parameters as we speak but this was just announced you know within the hour I gather 
and we'll be looking at it as we uh, as we move forward. So you didn't know that you had federal money available to we, house more people in motels. We knew we could. We had federal money till the end of the year, which we extended the program to the end of the year. We did not know that we had it extended until April first. Okay. And secondly, just just lastly, I mean. Just think about what we've done. We've helped with those that have been homeless. Sears, Sears Lane, for example. We've helped with financing, making sure that people have wraparound services there, have case management services. We've worked in collaboration with the city in, uh, in Burlington in order to make that. I think everyone but one has been placed. Uh, and I think that one wasn't placed because of um, some charges of violence. So we've done a lot here. Well, can I ask about something else? Um, what does the term let's go Brandon mean to you? Um, and do you think it's an appropriate first uh, salvo from the new GOP party chair? Um, well, it's a derogatory uh, statement towards the the underlying meaning is a derogatory statement uh, against the president. Um, we've been working well with the White House at this point in time. Uh, it's not something that I would do, um, but this is uh, what the uh, GOP, VT GOP, has decided. Um, for some, it's uh, lighthearted, um, but I take it somewhat personally, if you take it literally, and I, I just don't think it's necessary uh, at this point in time. So um, it's their choice. I didn't have any involvement in that, but uh, I think we should move on to other issues. Like, for instance, I mean, we're, if you look back at the numbers, 65% uh, of Vermonters voted for President Biden. I, I think we should be uh, looking as Republicans, we should be looking at how do we attract at least you know, 20% of them, 30% um, of them, uh, in order to uh, to win elections in the future, uh, not offend them. You don't approve. Is that fair? Yeah, I, it's just not something that I would do. But uh, but again, that's their prerogative. Spoken with Mr. Dame since his election. I have not. I have not. And and as I said before, I think he was the right choice uh, for the party. Uh, I think that uh, he will learn his way, and uh, I think that he'll offer a lot. But will uh, time will tell. The rally? I do. Governor Scott. You can go. Uh, Governor Scott, some states are um, not testing, COVID testing on Veterans Day as a way to honor the holiday. Is that something Vermont is considering? We are not testing on, I don't believe we're testing on, on Veterans Day either. But we'll be back at it on Friday and Saturday, correct? Well, maybe we better check. Yeah, we better I, check. I, I, we're, not, we're not vaccinating uh, on Thursday, are we? We're not vaccinating on Thanksgiving. Okay. Let me clear that up and get back to you because uh, I don't want to give you misinformation. I just have a question for Dr. Levine, but you can go. Sure. Dr. Levine, um, do we know how many students at St. Mike's um, who tested positive were vaccinated? <clears throat> I don't have that information right now. I do know that their vaccination rate for the campus is in the 95% range. So I have no doubts that many of them were vaccinated. Um, the, the, the administration there has told us that a lot of this was related to Halloween gatherings. So people in close contact sounds a little bit like what happened in Provincetown, Massachusetts a number of months ago. I was just saying, Governor, it looks like uh, Vermont's getting about 2.2 or so billion dollars uh, from the infrastructure bill. What, what do you envision some of that, that money going to? Well, obviously a major portion of that is roads and bridges, some of the traditional infrastructure. But as well, um, it's broadband, um, it's uh, water, a sewer, and climate change. Uh, so. Uh, we're still trying to come to grips with all of that and uh, make some plans in, in terms of presenting to the legislature. I'm not sure what's flexible and what's not. 
I spoke with, uh, with Senator Sanders last night. He called, and we're going to be uh, meeting shortly to just discuss uh, the future because, as, I, uh, as I've said uh, many times, uh, our biggest challenge in Vermont is workforce, um, trying to bring, attract more people uh, to, to come to Vermont, to stay here, uh, to raise families here, um, because we don't, have, we don't have the workforce we need today. Uh, to satisfy all the, the jobs that are available. And this new money, while well, it's, uh, it's, it's going to be essential uh, to our future and could be very effective for all 14 counties, specifically the rural uh, areas of the state, um, if we don't have the workforce to, to deliver, we're going to be in trouble. So uh, some of the initiatives that we've talked about over the last number of years that we presented to the legislature uh, that haven't, um, haven't been adopted we need to reconsider uh, because, again, we need the workforce. We need people here in order to uh, to uh, put these funds to good use. There's a five-year window that we can use these funds. These funds are paid out over five years. I mean, do you, do you think it can happen? I think it can happen, yes, yes. But, um, but we're going to have to, again, focus on areas like uh, housing, for instance. If we don't have the housing available, uh, to, uh, to attract more decent, affordable housing for the workforce, uh, we're not going to be able to attract people to come here to stay. Uh, so again, if we don't have the workforce, I mean, we're, we're at our limits at this point in time. We have uh, seen where we have more jobs uh, available than we have people to fill them. Um, so having this, well, great news to have this additional uh, funding uh, we uh, we need to make sure that we focus on the right things, and uh, and from my standpoint, it's uh, workforce development and attracting more families into the state. So are you saying that you'd like to use some of the 2.2 for housing? Or no, I mean don't don't forget. I mean this isn't the only money that we're receiving. I mean we have 1.2 billion dollars of ARPA funding, so um, some of that uh, can be maybe we need to. Uh, to double down on some of that because we're going to be able to have this, some money available in this uh, infrastructure bill for broadband, for instance. Uh, I had proposed that we spend $250 million for broadband out of the ARPA funding. That may not be enough, but, but let's say it is. Um, we, we are also receiving $100 million for um, broadband in the infrastructure bill. So we might be able to use $100 million out of the ARPA funding for more housing. So. Uh, I think this is something that we have to be strategic. Uh, we have to invest uh, in areas that give us the highest return, and I believe that will be in uh, workforce. I wanted to ask about Wesley Black. Um, he passed away yesterday um, at age uh, 36 um, due to cancer, and he um, was uh, he had prompted you to sign a burp, burn pit legislation. I wanted to know if you had um, anything to say about that. Yeah, uh, tragic. Uh, he is uh, someone who has committed his life to protecting us uh, in, in, in terms of military service. And um, it was just a, uh, devastating for, for his family, for, for him, uh, and obviously for all of the state of Vermont. So he'd be greatly missed. and. He was, uh, he was one of the many uh, who advocated for this burn pit legislation, and that's why we signed it, because this is so important um, so that we learn from the past and don't make the same mistakes in the future, and we take care of those who took care of us. Governor, you and members of your administration are wearing masks today. I believe the last time that was the case, we still had a state of emergency in place. Why that change? Well, you know, we've been providing guidance uh, for uh, a few weeks now uh, that when you're in certain situations, uh, you should be considering wearing a mask. While I feel uh, we've felt in the past we've been safe in this environment, we still are. There's 25 people here. And sometimes you have to practice what you preach. And uh, it's as much symbolism as anything else. And I just thought it was a good idea that we, we start to show that it's okay during this time, we should be uh, considering wearing masks in certain, certain situations. For myself, uh, I've been 
spending a lot of time on weekends. I, I go and uh, have my to-do list, and I find myself in hardware stores. Uh, and, and if I'm in there for a period of time, I put my mask on. I think it's a good idea. Um, if I'm going into a convenience store, I'm going in and out, uh, I typically don't wear a mask. I'm fully vaccinated. I have had my booster. And uh, that's not where we're finding uh, some of these situations. It's really about the gathering, small gatherings and, uh, and so forth inside. So again, it was just uh, showing, uh, providing leadership in that regard. But it's, uh, again, your choice. But we want you to make uh, logical ch uh, decisions and, and make the right decisions uh, as we move forward and get through this hump. Because we want everybody to be able to enjoy Thanksgiving and the rest of the holidays uh, that follow. It sounded like there might have been a change in guidance for masking. I know before when talking about masking indoors, there was a qualifier of if it's a crowded space. I didn't hear that qualifier today. Is that a change in guidance? Um, it, well, it's still uh, the same guidance from my perspective, which is it's guidance. Uh, so there's no mandate. You don't have to wear a mask when you're in here. Uh, you're fully vaccinated. We've been uh, we've talked about that extensively. Um, but uh, but you have to, you know, be aware of your surroundings, uh, make the right decisions, uh, weigh uh, the uh, uh, the vulnerabilities, and uh, and just come to your own conclusion. So. There's no difference in, in guidance. It's your, it's your choice. Governor Sununu, uh, citing dysfunction in Washington, said he wants to remain governor for another term. You can relate to that, I, uh, I suspect. What do you, what do you think of his decision? I think he made the right decision. For the same reason? Yeah, I mean, uh, we've, we've spoken about this in the past. And you know, it's a whole different world in Washington. Uh, I believe that you are effective as a governor making uh, policy and, and getting things done. And uh, I th I'm not sure uh, that Governor Sununu is one who likes to get things done as well. He's been a, a great partner uh, from a border state. We've worked together a lot in many different ways and sounding boards and so forth. So I think he made the right decision. Now to the phone, starting with Lisa Rathke, the Associated Press. Hi, thanks. Um, somebody told me that they had a hard time registering for a uh, booster shot online to the health department website. Um, and then when they called in the health department, um, the attendant told them that this issue's been happening. Um, they were told, you know, they got this note saying they were not qualified. Are you hearing anything about that, um, Secretary Smith? We've heard something on occasion, not, not a general theme, in that what you need to do is go down beside your history and hit the, uh, hit the button or the, click on the button next to your uh, vaccination history and it will bring you right in. Some people are clicking on a different button in order to bring that in. Again, if you call the health center, um, there has been, uh, there's somebody there to help you. Call the call center, there's somebody there to help you. I, you know, we've had 105,000 people um, get their boosters. Um, that is, um, that's quite an achievement. And I, you know, I haven't heard generally, I've heard um, I've heard one person tell me that they had an issue, and it was on an AARP call the other day, and it was that issue. They weren't going down to their history um, to see if they could click on what was a booster click, a booster button click. So we'll look into it. We'll always make changes to make it easier for people, uh, but we have uh, registered and, and vaccinated 105,000 people, and I... I hope we can make it even easier now. I do want to, Lisa, can, can I just go back to a previous question? Um, I am a veteran, and, and Thursday, I think, um, to honor vet, veterans who have served our country and, and, and protected our lives, we will be testing, we will be vaccinating on Thursday.
Thank you. Thank you. Lisa Loomis, the Valley Reporter. Good afternoon. Um, we're getting a lot of questions from community members who are seeking specific testing protocols for Thanksgiving, and I heard Dr. Levine say that that is coming. When it does come, our readers would very much like to know if they should schedule and take PCR tests three days before Thanksgiving and rapid antigen tests the day of. Does Vermont have the testing capacity for that on top of the current Delta surge? Testing capacity for the PCR test. <clears throat> We absolutely have testing capacity for the PCR test. <clears throat> the, the issue for the readers will be their timing because they don't want to get a test and then not have a result in time for the event that they got the test for. So you mentioned a three-day window, which is fine. Three days or more would be certainly protective in getting a result on time. Um, Antigen testing currently is not part of what the state of Vermont is doing at all of our testing centers. Uh, it is a part of testing, though. Right now, um, there are urgent care sites and other places where one can get an antigen test, and one can purchase their own antigen test either online or at a pharmacy um, and uh, also make that part of their testing protocol. So. We will come out with some uh, very clear guidance regarding that so that there's no confusion. But I think that answers the question you posed today. Yes, thank you. And then as a follow-up, in some states, rapid antigen tests are being made available in public libraries free of charge. Is this something that Vermont will consider? Or is there some other way that the state will be providing free or reduced price access to the rapid tests, the ones that are being used in schools? Yeah, so we, we certainly will discuss that. That's not something that we've decided anything about. I have to tell you that that's going to be, if I can read the tea leaves, the national testing strategy going into the future and going into uh, the virus being endemic and coming out of pandemic. Uh, having your own access to antigen tests so that you can make safe and good decisions when you're planning whatever you're planning uh, to do or whatever whom you're going to be with, especially if you're with somebody more vulnerable. So um, having access to free and rapid turnaround antigen testing is going to be really a critical part of the whole strategy. So I'll just ask you to stay tuned on that. Thank you. Guy Page, Vermont Daily Chronicle. Uh, Governor, uh, you and your officials today have mentioned that the increased cases among children um, is a reason to, to have them uh, vaccinated. Uh, however, isn't it also true that last week's high numbers of positives among children was in direct proportion to the high number of tests among children? Well, certainly um, we had, I think there was one day we had 18,000 tests and uh, a significant number of those. That was that big day that we had almost 500 positive cases. Um, so the more testing you do, the more you find. And uh, so that could be, um, but um, I'll let Commissioner Pichak answer that. Yeah, thank you, Governor. When we look at the per capita rates for the five to 11 year olds. Um, you know, they've been uh, the highest age group, not just this week or last week or the week before that, but really for the last two months. And um, we really haven't noticed anything disproportionately in terms of the amount of testing. I mean, if we, if we were to look at their positivity rate, um, you know, it would likely have gone up like the rest of the states as well. So again, that's, that's really the reason for why it's critical to get that age group vaccinated. Okay, thank you. Um, and, uh, Governor, uh, you and your uh, others in your administration today have said that other illnesses are increasing the load on Vermont ICUs. Uh, I know Commissioner Levine had touched on this, but, but what are they, and are they in any way related to the virus or to the vaccine? I think uh, they could be related in some, and that's what I said in my remarks, uh, because people 
we put off procedures, uh, people put off um, going to the doctors, uh, and so that is having uh, a ripple effect in some respects, uh, lagging a kind of uh, uh, health risk at this point in time, so they're ending up in the hospital. So there is, there is a connection for some of the cases, and, uh, but, but we have to keep in mind, I mean, we, our ICU capacity in the state is, um, hovers around 100, uh, depending on the staffing and so forth. So we don't have a great number of ICUs uh, when you think about it. So when you have 15, uh, 14, 15 cases of COVID uh, and the rest being uh, uh, the other, uh, it, uh, it certainly is uh, concerning. So we have to, to keep track of that because we want to make sure that we have the beds available. Certainly the ICU capacity to take care of those who or have an accident uh, and significant injuries uh, or uh, a heart attack or a stroke and have the beds available. Dr. Levine, anything you want to add to that? The guy, was there something about the nature of what cases are in the ICU that your question was, was asking? Yes, I guess what I'm really getting at, Commissioner Levine, is um, Given the, the high VAERS numbers of, of uh, COVID uh, vaccine reactions and some studies and reports saying that, uh, th that there, are, there are reactions to this, I just I wondered if there's any, any sense of vaccine reaction being, uh, being part of this. I and mean, we are the highest vaccinated state. And if there are vaccine reactions, it stands to reason that, that we will have more per capita than than others. Yep. No, I get your I get your line of logic. Um, I can assure you that the cases that are ending up in the ICU are generally not um, post vaccination related. They are chronic disease related <clears throat> and acute infection related, uh, as well as some COVID. Uh, and I would again caution everyone to use the VAERS data, the Vaccine Adverse Events Reporting System data very cautiously because it's all self-report, occasionally physician or provider report, and most of what's in there needs to be vetted, if you will, by the CDC uh, to try to uh, ascertain if there's a true relationship between the vaccine and what has been reported. Um, we certainly know there are major um, sentinel events like myocarditis or blood clots that have been clearly associated with the vaccines after looking at nationwide and worldwide experience. Uh, those are not the cases that are filling up our ICU, unfortunately, um, so, or fortunately. So the bottom line is, I don't think just because we have such a high vaccination rate, it explains what's going on in the ICUs, especially when we know, at least in the COVID cases, it's uh, two thirds to three quarters on any given day, unvaccinated people. Thank you. Aaron Tanko, Vermont Digger. Hi, um, I think that this question is for Dan French. Um, we've heard multiple times now of a planned agency of education survey to track lost instructional days, but we haven't seen any published results of that yet. Um, are there any updates on the status of that survey? Has it been sent to schools? Is it being compiled by the agency of education? And can you just confirm that these results will be released to the public at at some capacity, in some capacity, when they are available. Yeah, hi, uh, this is Dan French. Thanks for the question. Uh, we haven't launched that survey yet. Um, you know, Delta has really uh, forced us to put some of our uh, data collections on the back burner, if you will. Uh, we just launched a data collection on vaccination rate, uh, which we'll see as baseline information, particularly as the five through eleven vaccination campaign rolls out in the next couple of weeks. Uh, we do intend to uh, point the system towards uh, education recovery. Uh, we'd love to have started the school year that way, but unfortunately, again, Delta has sort of put that off. Um, but we are planning to launch that survey. I'm not quite sure uh, when we'll do that, perhaps in the month of December. 
Uh, but when we do uh, have the results, we will make them public. And I also noticed that there was a rise in reported COVID cases in, in the DOH report in the past uh, week. Um, do you know how much of that is attributable to the spike that's going on and how much of it could be the result of like surveillance testing and increased testing throughout the state? Is that it's probably for one of us then? Is that a school issue, Erin, or is it? Uh, are you moving on to just generally? I mean, I was I was specifically talking about the rise in school cases, going from 153 cases as of November 1st to 217 cases in schools. Got it. Um, and I was wondering if you you had kind of an explanation for what was going on there, if that was part of the COVID spike, or if that was maybe the result of surveillance testing that's going on now. Um, maybe Dan French has the statistics on how many schools surveillance tests have been conducted. Maybe the Department of Health might have that data. I don't know. I'm going to let both. Yeah, hi, Aaron. Uh, this is Dan French. I'll, I can start, Governor. Um, yeah, I, didn't, I wasn't clear and if you were asking me that question or not. I apologize for the delay. Um, my, my general perception of the data since the opening of schools is that cases in schools have more or less paralleled uh, the cases in the broader population. Again, um, what we see in schools is general reflection of what goes on in the community. Um, but I don't know if we have any more specific understanding of that. Maybe Commissioner Pichek would add to that or not. Yeah, if we, neither Commissioner Pichek nor I have anything to add to that, uh, Secretary French. The testing levels in the schools seems to be a pretty stable phenomenon. Um, there hasn't been a surge in surveillance testing that would explain the increased number of cases, so it most likely does reflect just what we're seeing in the general community's environment. Okay, thank you. Peter Hirschfeld, VPR. Thank you, Jason. Uh, Secretary Smith, I'm wondering how many uh, beds you're going to have at the ready when adverse weather conditions criteria kick in for folks who will be seeking emergency housing under that program. Um, I, I do know, Secretary Smith will answer this one, but um, I do know we have 1,500 people involved in the program now, about 1,000 families. Uh, I believe. Yeah, Peter, you're asking how m we have about we're we have about 1,500 people, as the governor said, about 1,200 adults, about 300 uh, children in our um, general assistance program. Now, the hotel motel program, uh, we've placed over the year about 1,500 people into um, into permanent housing, but. I think what you're asking, and I don't know if I have the answer for it, but I'm going to ask you to clarify. I think what you're asking is how many more hotel rooms we have available than what we're occupying right now? What, what I'm asking is uh, there's going to come uh, a day when the forecast calls for temperatures below 20 degrees. People who are unhoused right now will, in that moment, um, become eligible for emergency housing under the adverse, adverse weather condition program. Do I have that right so far? So far. And I'm wondering how many slots you will have at the ready for that first night when uh, people are eligible for that AWC housing. Yeah, I, I don't have that number for you. I'll try to get some of that number, but I'll, I'll tell you it's going to be limited because we still are are housing uh, 1500 people the the issue is um availability of hotel motel rooms as we move forward we are scouring the state right now and we've mentioned this to uh, legislative leadership we are scouring the state right now for buildings that we could use as temporary shelter sites uh, for those individuals uh, the, we are looking at anything, and we would welcome input 
into uh, where we could find, whether it's college dorm, uh, unused college dorms, unused uh, facilities that we're, we're looking at. But um, we are limited in the hotel motel program by the number of mot uh, motel hotel rooms that are, are available. And right now we're, we're near capacity. Matter of fact, we're turning away some people, unfortunately, that do qualify under the existing program because we don't have the hotel motel space um, that, we, uh, that we would like as we move forward. So is there, there's no guarantee that, let's say, uh, we're going to have a 15-degree night next week. Um, there's no guarantee that you're going to have shelter available for everybody who asks for it? Yeah, I don't think there was ever a guarantee, Peter, that we would have shelter available. It was a lot easier when we were dealing with 300 at max during the coldest uh, winter days of the year. But, um, you know, we, we are at 1,500 now. And that's going to have, and 500 in shelters. We're trying to build 500 more shelter spaces, not build, but find 500 more shelter spaces. We think that would accommodate most of the people that are out there. Um, one last question for Commissioner Pichak. Commissioner Pichak, you have a slide deck in your presentation today uh, that says uh, COVID-19 cases are not expected to decrease over the next four weeks. I'm wondering if you did a modeling scenario in which uh, Vermont had more restrictive mitigation measures, and if so, um, what what the modeling foresaw under that scenario? Yeah, no, thanks for the question, Peter. So, you know, this is the ensemble model from the CDC. It puts together about 20 uh, different models. I don't believe any of those models um, at this point game out different scenarios based on mitigation measures or behavior. But like always, it comes down to behavior on these, um, on these models, whether there are mitigation measures in place or not. If people follow the guidance or follow the mitigation measures, then you know, cases will be better than the modeling predicts. So that ultimately is um, the key here. Thank you all. Joseph Gresser, Martin Chronicle. Just keep oh, in mind the, the number, the percentage of those uh, uh, being infected are amongst the unvaccinated, somewhere around 70%. So that would tell you that, um, first of all, um, they should get vaccinated. That would, that would help. Um, but at the same time, as we are moving forward, we are, they're developing some immunity along the way by becoming infected. So that should, uh, that should affect us uh, in some way, in a positive way. Uh, over the next uh, few months, but we want to keep them out of the hospital. And so getting vaccinated is the best policy at this point. Joseph Gresser, Martin Chronicle. Tim McQuiston, Vermont Business Magazine. Hi, thanks, Governor. Um, I think Lisa Rapsky's question gets back to people concerned about whether they're eligible or not, and not a technical issue. For instance, on the VDH website, it says, um, um, get extra protection with a booster shot if you are 18 or older and you received your second dose of Pfizer Moderna at least six months ago or Johnson Johnson vaccine at least two months ago. And then it goes on, it's especially important if you're 65 and older and have health conditions. But there's not a, a qualif qualifier in that, in that first um, recommendation. And people are under 65 or wondering whether they can sign up or not. And the, the state's website, and if you call as well, makes it seem like you can't get a booster. Whereas if you just go onto the pharmacy sites, you just click I'm eligible and you move on from there. And I think people are looking for a little bit more clarity on whether they're eligible to get a booster or not. I, I would say the vast majority of people uh, are eligible if you read the number of qualifications. Uh, and so I would say if you want one, you can get one. Secretary Smith. Tim, it's been a few weeks since I looked at the website, but the website 
um, I believe says somewhere in that, in, in that list that, or if you are exposed um, or feel exposed to COVID-19 uh, uh, or an occupation where you feel exposed to COVID-19, you are eligible. And then there's a, a, a place where you can go down and put a, a, a password into that where the password is right there. It's called, it's booster all in capital letters um, right there. So you can, you can access that. We've been really, really consistent here in talking about who's eligible for boosters, primarily 65 and above. Uh, th those can get a third shot that are, that have a immune system that's compromised. Uh, you talked about several other issues, you know, but we've been really, you know, if you feel ex that you're exposed to COVID-19 through your occupation or anything else, we believe you should get a booster. Um, that's, you know, I, I, can't, I can't be clearer than that. And I hope I'll go back and check the website, Tim, to make sure that it has that qualifying statement on it. But I think it, the qualifying statement um, does open it up for people to, um, to look at where what they can do and where they can get a booster and how they can get a booster. And Dr. Levine may have more. If I could read the relevant paragraph. <clears throat> For Pfizer and Moderna boosters, if you are 18 to 64, you should get a booster if you received your second dose at least six months ago and you feel at risk of getting COVID-19. We do the detail all the ways the CDC defines the risk, but that essentially tells you your concern level um, for getting a booster helps define your risk. All right, thank you all. That was uh, the, the clarification I think a lot of people are looking for. The other thing, um, I see that Dr. Levine's running away there, but um, I guess the comment last, last week and I think people are wondering how to respond to uh, things like this. Uh, a middle-aged adult Vermonter said, I'm not gonna get a vaccine because I've heard that if you get back, if you get COVID after you've been vaccinated, it's gonna be worse than if you're unvaccinated. And, and how, how are the rest of us supposed to respond to comments like that? Don't believe everything you hear and read. <laughs> I can run, but I can't hide. Um, so, if there's one thing that we've been saying for many, many, many months now is if you are vaccinated and you might get what's called a breakthrough case, that's the term that's used, meaning you got COVID after you were vaccinated, you still have heavy protection against the most severe outcomes, hospitalizations, going to the ICU, or dying. So yes, you may get COVID. It's now about a 1% chance in the state of Vermont, but that's uh, not consonant with what your reader was saying about it'll be much worse if I get it on top of the vaccine. So that's all I can say. All right, thank you very much. Fiora Engel-Smith, VT Digger. Um, hi, so I have a question about ICU capacity, and I guess I wanted to know how much of our ICU capacity issue is a staffing issue versus a demand for services issue. I think it's about um, five to, at any given day, it's not consistent, five to 10%. So if we have 101, anywhere between uh, five and 10 beds are impacted uh, due to staffing. And then uh, what happens when we get to capacity? Like, what's the plan? Uh, we have plans that we've made, uh, nothing that we are ready to publicly communicate at this point in time, but we do have contingency plans in place. And the last question is, when do you guys project the peak of, like, ICU demand? We don't believe that's going to be the case if we... Um, do everything that we've, we're talking about doing. And people get their vac uh, vaccines, they get their boosters, uh, get kids uh, vaccinated. 
uh, wear uh, a mask when you're indoors, at least during the height of this, uh, this higher volume of cases. And, uh, and as we move inside, uh, we'll get through this without reaching that peak. But what if we do? Like what happens then? We'll put in place the contingency plans. Thank you. Ed Barber, Newport Daily Express. Yes, uh, good afternoon. Uh, Governor, a lot of the uh, focus these days has been on the shortage in the labor market, uh, but do you have any information you could share about the impact the lack of supplies are having? If you uh, have a department store and you don't have inventory, you don't need employees. So could you, could you address that issue? Um, well, if you use the, I, I mean, I don't know of any industry I, I, at this point in time. I, I, I understand what you're saying, um, but, uh, but the vast majority have enough supplies to do something. And so there's still a need for those hardware store employees because there are people in looking for all the things they do have in stock. Um, as well in the, uh, in the trades, uh, other than, you know, they're looking for alternatives. So, uh, let's say line striping. I know there was a shortage of paint for line striping. So we had to, um, we had to investigate whether there's any alternatives. Uh, we had to put those into place and we accepted some alternatives um, that we're, we'll watch and see if they're as effective as the, the product that was uh, spec to begin with, but it kept people going. So, um, is there one specific area that you have a concern uh, that there is no materials available that I might be able to address? I think it might come. It would come through areas, for example, of uh, shipments of meat to restaurants. <clears throat> if there's a supply shortage and they're not getting it, um, kind of cuts down on the menu, if you will. Yeah. Well, they're fairly creative and I, I don't know about uh, some of the, the fast food but some of the independent uh, restaurants get creative and they come up with other entrees and other products to to sell but again this is impacting uh, all of us in significant ways um, the supply chain issue is real so uh, again trying to get uh, the the ships uh, to shore into the ports and get those distributed uh, is, is something that they're, they're facing we're facing on a national level but uh, but that could be related to truck drivers for instance I know uh, that's with with fuel supplies uh, as well as uh, some of the other supplies it's all due to trying to get those into the hands of uh, uh, of the businesses and it's just we don't have enough truck drivers to go around so we're being impacted here in Vermont on that. I, I talk, we talk a great deal in these press conferences uh, about every sector being impacted in one way or another and uh, uh, by uh, labor shortages. So I would say if, there's, uh, if okay. there are people that are, are impacted or not ha don't have a job uh, as a result of supply issues, uh, there are other opportunities and we would be uh, happy to help them find a, a, a job or an opportunity uh, to keep them going. Okay, thank you very much. Andrew McGregor, Caledonian Record. Uh, yes, good afternoon, thank you. Uh, for Secretary Smith, uh, you cited a percentage of the five to 11 year old population that had either already received their first dose or were scheduled to receive one. Uh, could you provide those numbers again, and do you know if that is evenly distributed across all regions of the state, or are there some regions that have a higher percentage of kids signing up than others? That's a good question. Let me, let me, the, the number is 14,360 children ages 5 to 11 that, uh, that you cited that uh, appointments to get vaccinated are already uh, begun vaccinated. I said that was about 30% of Vermont kids in that age range. We have about 44,000 throughout the state. Let me do this. Let me uh, find out how that, I don't have that distribution with me, but let me find out how that distribution is and get that number to you. 
Um, we'll get it to you sooner than we did uh, last week on your question. I apologize for that. I just realized we didn't get back to you on a timely basis, but we will this time. Thank you for that. Um, and while you're at the podium, uh, uh, for you, Secretary Smith, or perhaps, Dr. Levine, uh, you both addressed um, the need for volunteers uh, to the Medical Reserve Corps. Um, is that request a direct response to an acute shortage? And is a staff shortage a limiting agent in terms of um, uh, the capacity for vaccination clinics for boosters and kids? Yeah, it hasn't been um, a, a limiting factor on vaccination, but the, over the last week, we've been scrambling uh, for, for personnel to man the vaccination clinics. And we've been successful in getting people at vaccination clinics, but we just want, we just want this reserve uh, amount of people to not be sort of reactive, being proactive and making sure that we have enough people in reserve in order to handle um, all the vaccination sites that we, and we, and as I cited, we have both the adult uh, vaccination and booster and the kid booster uh, sites going on. And, and there's a lot of vaccination going on in the state. And so we want to be prepared and making sure we have enough personnel. Dr. Levine, do you want Ms. I, Okay. Uh, I guess I would just, uh, an extension on the, on the question of, of geography, uh, scrambling to find personnel. Is that statewide or in specific pockets of the state? You know, I think where I noticed it was in specific pockets, but I think um, as we gear up, um, it, will, it will immediately, you know, we've added clinics too, um, and that is where we see our, our issue. For example, we added a clinic in Springfield and we, and we needed personnel to, uh, to deal with that. So I think it's it's a little bit of both, Greg. It's it's um, it is um, adding the clinics that we've added, um, and the ability to react in any way that we want to react in this vaccination. Again, we are vaccinating um, a lot of people, and it just um, it's just good to have a reserve uh, of people to be in the background if we need them. Okay. Uh, thank you for your time, and I look forward to um, your response to my earlier question. We, we will get that to you in a timely way. Uh, Dr. Levine, you want to? I just want to add a little point of perspective. Um, the state of Vermont is doing uh, a lot of vaccination at one time. Still trying to get people for their first time, working with the new pediatric population, and uh, working with boosters of all ages. Um, we are, I won't say a rare state, but we're one of the less common states that is still um, manning abundant community clinics and now school-based clinics as well. There are states that are relying completely on the healthcare system and on the pharmacies to uh, do the heavy lifting for this. So we are doing this really through multiple directions. So again, um, I don't want it to be sort of misinterpreted that um, our efforts are poorly uh, structured or anything of that sort. We're actually just doing what we've done for so long now uh, in terms of vaccinating people, uh, trying to use as many modalities as possible to get the best throughput and uh, best experience for Vermonters. Greg Lamoureux, the County Courier. Good afternoon, Governor. Um, as you've probably heard, there was a judge here in Franklin County that threw out hundreds of criminal cases due in part to a backlog uh, driven by COVID and a lack of resources to prosecute the cases. I'm wondering what your take is on dismissing entire categories of criminal cases in one fell swoop. And, and also, um, your office presents the initial starting point for the state's budget every year. I'm, I'm wondering if it's a priority to you to allot more resources to the judicial system so that this doesn't have to keep happening. Yeah, first of all, I think uh, it's unfortunate that all the cases were dropped across the board. 
Um, I think there should be some accountability uh, for those who break the law. Uh, secondary, uh, the, your second question is about the uh, budget development. We, we are a third branch of government. We're the executive branch, the legislative branch, the executive branch, and judicial branch. They come up with their own budget and they present it to us. We incorporate that uh, into our budget, but we don't, uh, we don't develop their budget. They do that on their own. Would you be looking to increase what they're even asking for? Again, they are a separate branch of government and they are fully capable of developing their own budget, not something that we need to get involved in. Understood. Uh, one more question here, Governor, and, and this may be for Dr. Levine, I'm not quite sure. Um, I've been hearing from people who are involved in the lab testing within state government that there's more and more breakthrough cases that are, are coming back as false negatives. Um, I'm told that people are getting negative results and then, you know, still showing signs and a few days later getting tested again, getting a positive result. Uh, we've been hearing for months from your administration that statistically you're much more likely to get COVID or, or a positive test from COVID if you're unvaccinated, but with the premise that you're more likely to get a negative test if you are vaccinated, or a, particularly a false negative if you're vaccinated, I'm wondering if the data is inherently flawed, and, and I'm wondering if you can share shed a little light on that for clarity. Maybe uh, just if you could be just a little more clear, are you talking about antigen testing or PCR testing? I uh, believe it's PCR testing. It's testing done in a lab. <clears throat> yeah, thanks for the question. It, I think the premise is wrong. Uh, and I do think that uh, the reality is when PCR testing has been criticized, it's because the belief is that it was too sensitive. So it was picking up people that might have had some fragments of virus in their nose, whether it be early or very late in their infection, and the test was positive, but the person was actually doing fine. Um, we know that vaccinated people can transmit the virus, and that's why the CDC reframed their masking guidance during the Delta surge. So there are people who are vaccinated who you could test and might find they have a positive result, but they never would have self-reported themselves as a case because they actually are doing fine. So again, it's too sensitive as opposed to not picking up cases. And even a vaccinated person who has the coronavirus in their nose will test positive whether they have symptoms or not. The vaccine should not be impeding the ability for the PCR test to pick that up. That's all I can say. Thank you. Does that change with the other type of testing? With the antigen testing. Uh, yeah. So um, antigen testing can be less sensitive if you're doing it just as a one-time event. But if you're doing it in a sequential fashion uh, and it turns positive, that's really uh, the way it was designed, in a sense. Um, the vaccination status, again, of the person shouldn't markedly interfere with that. Because each of these tests is picking up different aspects of the virus in terms of its molecular makeup. And that, the vaccine doesn't change that makeup in any way. Okay, thank you, Dr. Levine. Thank you, Governor. Tom Davis, Compass Vermont. Uh, no questions today. Thanks very much, Jason. Thank you, Tom. Chris Roy, Newport Daily Express. Yes, good afternoon. Now, uh, this question might be for um, Commissioner French. We're hearing from a family up here in the Northeast Kingdom who had to pull their child out of school because she has a medical condition and can't wear a mask. And they have a doctor's note that says that, but apparently that's not enough. 
And I'm just wondering if that's the standard across the state and what the state mandate is for, um, for masks in schools. Well, first of all, we don't have a mandate uh, in place from a statewide level. This was guidance that we provided uh, to the local school districts. All but one uh, district adopted the guidelines, and that, uh, that one being uh, Canaan and one school. So um, we provided the guidance. Uh, the, the local communities decided on uh, whether they were going to implement that guidance or not. Secretary French. Yes, thanks, Governor, and thanks, Chris. Um, yeah, to your question about a doctor's note, I, I think, you know, there is a mechanism by which uh, schools can and are required to provide reasonable accommodations for students who have medical conditions. Um, I saw, I think we're talking about the same case that I saw recently in the media. Um, I'm not familiar with exactly what was in the doctor's note, and I think that might be the issue. Um, you know, you can't necessarily have a doctor's note to excuse a student from complying with school requirements like wearing a mask. Uh, but if the doctor's note uh, contained diagnosis information and so forth, it could be the basis for a school to uh, work with a parent to create an accommodations plan. Uh, but I'd have to look more specifically at the case. Okay, thank you. Colin Flanders, seven days. Uh, yeah, I had a question about our booster vaccine guidance. Um, after sitting through these for a few weeks, I mean, it really does seem like you're trying to walk a fine line here between saying that everyone should get a booster and limiting it um, to how some other states have. I'm just curious why you aren't just coming out and saying everyone should go get a booster when that seems to be your intent here, saying if you want it, you can get one. Um, is there any concern that you could go too far and get in trouble with the federal government? Is that the thinking here? Or why not just have a blanket statement, get a booster? Well, I think we've been saying that if you want a booster, you can get a booster. Um, so I think we've been clear that uh, there's a lot of flexibility there. And if you read the conditions that the CDC uh, laid out, uh, that you would qualify. If you feel that you can contract uh, COVID, for instance, uh, then you can get a booster. So I think we're saying the same thing, um, but we're trying to adhere to the CDC guidance and and uh, I think we have. I mean, I think that's that opens the door uh, wide open in terms of whether you can or can't. So if you want a booster, you should get one. It, I mean, that's a different message, though, than saying everyone should get a booster. We were saying early on everybody should get vaccinated. Or I, I guess I would disagree that those are the same statements. Well, I think it should be your choice whether you get a booster or not, and is somewhat as, uh, um, determining your own risks uh, as well. I think uh, the older you are, I think uh, it's it's a better idea uh, to get one. Uh, but those are decisions you make on your own. Dr. Levine. So back to your earlier part of the question, that's why we have been very careful to at least list all of the things the CDC uh, mentions. But keep in mind, the middle of the night change that Dr. Walensky made was to vastly expand and use a list of occupational risks, which was her way of really trying to make sure that if you feel just by virtue of what you do every day, you come in contact with people and that puts you at risk that you would not fail to take advantage of the fact that there are boosters available. To make it uh, a little less muddy in the future, you're seeing reports now of the Pfizer and Moderna manufacturers um, showing results of trials done in 18-year-olds and older, so people under 65 but older than 18, uh, who just get boosters, trying to show that indeed that is a safe as well as effective strategy for improving the immune status of everybody in the population. So I think it's going to be a moot point in the near future because I think you'll see the FDA uh, authorizing over 18, get a booster, if the data bears that out. Thanks, and then I have one additional question. Um, Governor Scott, you had said that you do not think we will get to a level where our ICUs will be overrun. I'm curious, 
what you're basing that belief on, given that our modeling shows a wide range of outcomes. Um, and the second part of that is why not disclose the plans of what would happen when that, if that were to occur? Well, there are a number of different uh, strategies depending on what we're seeing. Uh, so we'll make that determination when and if it happens, and we don't believe it will happen. We've been uh, having high case counts uh, for a number of weeks, and and we are hovering about the same number of hospitalizations and ICU uh, numbers. So we don't believe that it will exceed uh, the limitations of the healthcare system. But but again, we just want everyone to know we're we're prepared to take action if and when that does happen. But we're we're trying to uh, work with the hospitals now to increase some of the ICU capacity and and uh, making sure that they're like, for instance, um, making sure there's enough uh, bed space available for, we worked with the uh, Veterans Administration uh, to, uh, to the VA to make sure, to ask them if they would uh, take some of the uh, mental health uh, patients and uh, we, we uh, were successful in doing that. So that relieves some pressure there. So we're just looking for different opportunities uh, to make sure that we have the space available when and if it's needed. But, but again, um, I don't know it's the modeling uh, when you say that it's showing that we'll get there. I don't think that's accurate. I, I believe all of the modeling has shown that it's going the other direction. I would, uh, well, just to clarify, I didn't say that the modeling is showing we'll get there. I'm saying the modeling is showing a wide range of potential outcomes and we're hearing that cases will continue to go up for at least the next four weeks. Um, that's that's why I was curious as to what you're basing the idea that we're not going to get yeah. there. It sounds like you're saying we haven't got there yet, so we probably won't. Yeah, I, I think that's true. But but I may ask Commissioner Pichek to elaborate because when I saw the modeling, it seemed like there was a a wide range, but it was actually under what we are experiencing. So I don't see that. I don't think anyone um, has said that we're going to exceed where we are today. But maybe Commissioner Pichak can clear that up. Yeah, thank you, Governor. So the um, you know I think the the modeling didn't say that cases were going to go up over the next four weeks. We just said they're not projecting that they're going to decline. So either sort of at a rate that we're at now or a little bit less even, uh, you know, basically what we've been seeing over the last two weeks, but that they're not going to have a trend downward uh, over the next four weeks. So that's what the modeling shows. But just like we've just, you know, answered a little bit earlier in the press conference, it always uh, comes down to, you know, what happens on the ground and what people's behaviors are and, and how the cases actually trend. So, um, you know, I think that's going to be uh, certainly the most important. Uh, but obviously, as cases go up or as cases are higher, then you're worried about what will follow with hospitalizations. So we'll def definitely keep a close look on that. Thanks. Kevin Cullen, the Boston Globe. Thanks, Jason. Um, Governor, I'm speaking to you from Hartford, um, where your kind words about West Black are very much appreciated. Um, given that Wes had spent his last year not just fighting for his own life, but for the health and safety of his fellow veterans, losing him so close to Veterans Day is very poignant indeed. Uh, back to... Uh, the same subject we've been talking about mostly today. I, I'm, I'm wondering, Governor, given the level of record infections last week, do you wrestle with your decision, your, your, your view on mandating masks? Is that something that you go back and forth on when, when you hear from other legislators or you hear from other public health officials or public health workers who believe in a mask mandate? Does that does it ever change your opinion? Do you wrestle with this? Well, no, we do hear um, many different opinions on whether a mass mandate is effective or not. And, uh, and I contend that putting a mass mandate into place, putting a state emergency in place and a mass mandate in place would not be effective uh, because I think that uh, the vast majority of Vermonters are back to their normal lives. And I, when we see the, the cases and where they're, uh, we're seeing the most transmission, it really is in some of the gatherings, uh, some of the small gatherings, whether it's in a, um, a, a club or a, a, a bar or at somebody's home. Um, that's where we're seeing uh, a lot of these cases. So 
I think it's uh, extremely, extremely difficult at this point in time uh, to reimpose a mass mandate and, and uh, be naive enough to think that people are going to follow it. Uh, we see other states, there's a handful of states throughout the country uh, that have a, a mass mandate. I think Nevada does, New Mexico, uh, I can't think of the others, but, uh, but they're seeing their cases rise. So I, I'm just not sure that it's effective. Uh, and, and again, we have other uh, mitigation me measures in place. Uh, we think that uh, we're, we're focused on vaccinations. We think that gives us uh, the, the most uh, that will have the most impact on uh, Vermont, uh, the boosters and the, of course, the vaccinations, of the five to 11 year olds. So um, we believe this strategy is the most uh, effective way uh, without disrupting uh, everything else in our lives that people have become accustomed to um, getting back to somewhat normal. Governor, are you basing your position on more social science than medical science and the idea that it would lead to confrontations that could be ugly or I'm curious because it seems that the, the medical evidence that you folks have cited for months is that masks work. Yeah, I think, but it's, again, I think you're absolutely right. It's the social science um, because you can put all of the um, uh, restrictions in, into place and if they're not adhered to, uh, then it's all for naught. Uh, and then you do create uh, areas of confrontation. We were fortunate here in Vermont uh, that we had a, a number, a great deal uh, of uh, people who did the right thing uh, for the right reasons uh, and were a willing partner at the appropriate time. And uh, we can't be in a uh, perpetual state of emergency here. It uh, would be an abuse of power. Uh, and again, I don't think the vast majority of Vermonters feel we're in an emergency right now, not when we're back to our daily lives, going to restaurants, going out to different events, uh, maybe taking in a, a hockey game or a football game or, or a baseball game. I mean, people are back to doing the things they did uh, previous. Um, but, uh, but again, the medical science uh, would probably say uh, that if every, everyone was masked up, it would have an effect. But, but again, uh, I don't think we're able to do that. Now, again, I will say uh, when uh, when I've traveled around the state and go into different uh, uh, environments, whether it's, like I said, in the hardware store, vast majority of people in a, a small restricted place in a public area are wearing masks. I mean, we're, we're seeing it. So without a mask mandate, they're doing the right thing. And for those who aren't, the mask mandate isn't going to affect them. They're not going to adhere to that. That's my- My, my final question. Thank you, Governor. My, my final question would be to Dr. Levine and just ask, do you agree with that? He said yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm not starting any more trouble. Bye. Thank you. Of course I agree with that. Uh, so to put it on record, I am a firm believer in masks. I am a firm believer in the literature on mask mandates and I've quoted it abundant times. I have to be cautious though in having everyone who thinks it is the simple way out that the governor is correct. There's a lot of behavioral issues there that one has to really deal with um, to make sure that people actually do fulfill what a mask mandate says. You also need to look at the experience of the states which are few, as the governor said. Um, Nevada, New Mexico, Illinois, Washington, Oregon, the District of Columbia, and Hawaii are the ones I can remember. And I don't believe there are any more. If there are maybe one or two. Um, very mixed experiences if you plot out over time when their surges occurred, what their uh, date of mask mandate was, when it came to an end, all of that, um, in the era of the Delta variant. All the other SARS-CoV-2 virus that we lived with before, is a, it's the same virus, yes, but it's not as transmissible as the Delta variant. And so 
I would just reserve judgment until the analyses come in over ensuing months as to what was the efficacy of mask mandates during the Delta era, because it's really important for us to at least be open-minded about the fact that from what I can see, there's been great variability in uh, the success rate, if you will, of the mask mandates. And when I talk to fellow state health officials from other states, um, they say what the governor has been saying, that you know, when they go into certain places, they're seeing people who are adhering to the rules, but then there are other circumstances, which are probably the more transmission-prone circumstances, where actually the compliance is not the same. Um, and, and that may sort of sabotage the whole intent of what the mandate was. Um, I also want to just make an important take-home message based on the previous question that came in. Sorry to use the, the Globe's time on this, but um, when we talk about the ICU, you know, we, we, we're seeing higher case numbers last week in, in those peak days, so one would predict that if people are going to get sick at the same rate and require hospitalization at the same rate, then there's just going to be more of them because there were more cases. And that could culminate in more people in an ICU. So part of what we're doing here is just saying, you know, we're trying to project a little ahead. No, nothing about modeling or anything. It's just look at how many cases we have, who they're impacting, and exercise some appropriate concern about the downstream effects of that. But the take-home message, actually, to come back to your question, needs to be this is the time that you want to do all the things that I mentioned in my opening comments, including be careful about those gatherings and wear your masks in the circumstances that you should be wearing them in. Because whether you are the vulnerable person or whether your behavior is going to impact somebody else who is vulnerable and does end up in the ICU, uh, that's why we're asking you right now to take these numbers seriously. Not that we believe this is going on forever and ever and that we're going to totally need you know, 30 new ICU beds. We just want to make sure that we don't have that situation arise and people's behaviors will help really determine that. The theme, protecting the much. vulnerable. Thank you. Chris Mays, Brattleboro Reformer. I guess I was wondering um, if there's anything driving the elevated case count in Bennington County. It's, it's really very difficult uh, to know. And, and if you have any ideas, uh, maybe you could let us know. Um, it's <laughs> interesting when you look at the data, and I look at it every single day. Uh, last week, as you might recall, uh, last week or the week before, we were seeing 30% of the cases uh, in uh, the Northeast Kingdom, uh, which for that population uh, was dramatic. Uh, so, uh, but today I think they're down in the maybe nine, ten percent um, Yesterday, I believe I saw that uh, Bennington and Rutland County had around, um, let's say, I'm going to guess at this, like 15%. Uh, and today it's 30%. So at any given time, there's some spikes, and I don't know whether there's any rhyme or reason, uh, whether there was a, uh, an event uh, at that point in time that uh, led to that in, in the area. And uh, typically that's what's, what's happened. It's one event, like uh, Chittenden County today, I'd say, is due to St. Michael's College. That's what I would guess. So. It just depends on whatever happened in that region uh, that uh, that might have might have caused it. But I, I don't know if there's anything that we have been able to pick up on at this point in time. But eventually, maybe uh, through contact tracing, which again is difficult uh, right now with this variant because the variant works so quickly and infects so quickly. Um, so. It's been uh, difficult uh, to utilize the contact tracing, which was worked so well with us uh, with the original COVID-19 because it gave us a little time to, uh, to make sure that we uh, 
were able to uh, snuff that out, so to speak. Uh, and my last question was, do you, I think this is for Secretary Bench, do, do you know what um, school staff vaccination rates look like at this point throughout Vermont? Uh, thanks, that's uh, one of the items we're asking in our statewide data collection. Um, I will, I'll make the observation that I think we have a uh, high, high staff vaccination rate. We think it's above 90%. I think I'll also say that I think from my impression traveling around the state that that's also fairly consistent from school to school. I think, you know, our student vaccination rate on the other hand of the population that is, uh, was eligible previously, the 12 to 18 year olds, uh, we also had a state uh, average high vaccination rate, I think above 75%. Uh, but what I've noticed around the state is that, that that rate does vary more so than the staff vaccination rate. So um, to the earlier question about um, geographically how the, the 5 to 11 vaccination rate is playing out, I think it's early to tell, but it's something we're going to have to keep an eye on uh, because I think there will be some variation of student vaccination rates much greater than the adult oh. vaccination rate. Thank you. Is, um, with Dr. Levine, um, are you concerned that an outbreak of that size um, occurred in a highly vaccinated community? I'm concerned that it happened, yes. Am I surprised that it happened? No, based on what we've seen around the country. Um, this virus can do just that. I would, I don't know this for a fact, but I would put money on these cases being very mild and uh, not causing a great deal of distress, but still a case is a case and it's unfortunate it happens. But we saw in Provincetown abundant healthy people who were gathered together too closely at a susceptible time. Um, the part of the press that hasn't been reported as widely about Provincetown is that even with its big tentacles where it spread to other states, et cetera. The number of hospitalizations and deaths was very, very, very small, uh, considering we're talking 1,000 people totally infected. Is there maybe more recommendations you could offer college students in addition to masking and testing? Is our college students, you know, should they consider even more precautions? I think the precautions are just the ones that the president of the St. Michael's College offered, which is gatherings are not going to get us there. It's unfortunate that they let their guard down, um, didn't follow the colleges or the state's guidance regarding being careful with things like Halloween gatherings. So, you know, the campuses are doing very well. Um, and they are basically highly vaccinated. 95 plus percent across the board in Vermont. The campus's testing policies are very consistent with what they should be at this point in time for such a vaccinated campus. And the um, results have been pretty non-disrupted semesters this time around, uh, except for certain individuals. And at St. Mike's, they, they put a pause on things, but I believe they're starting classes up again. So. It's hard to give them much more advice other than just what we're telling everybody, which is protect yourselves and especially protect those who are highly vulnerable by trying to do all the right things during this real peak time of Delta till we can get through this. Thank you. That's it. Thank you very much. And we'll see you again next Tuesday.